President Trump, we are so excited to have you here with us in Iowa tonight. Thank you. And well, thank you. uh you've just got a great group of supporters here in this state. You really do. You really do. Thank you very much. And, and Mr. President, new inflation numbers are out this week, and they show inflation is again up under Biden. And the new polling shows 61 percent of small businesses believe Bidenomics is bad for the economy. When you return to the White House, what is the first thing you'll do to turn around Biden's economic nightmare? Well, first of all, I think he's been a disaster as a president. He's the worst president in the history of our country. Uh, the happiest person around right now is Jimmy Carter, I've been saying this because he uh, looks like a brilliant president by comparison, like literally brilliant by comparison to this guy. Uh, there's never been anybody like him. Uh, now we have another war going on in the Middle East just started up. And uh, we have our uh, Secretary of Defense is sitting in a hospital room looking at his laptop. That's how he's running the war, like oh. a child would look at a laptop. It's uh, disgraceful what's going on. It's a disgrace. And uh, Bidenomics is the least of it, but it's been a disaster for the country. Uh, inflation's now going up again. But really, look at the inflation that's taken place over the last three years. I was looking today. Energy's up at 38 percent, and uh, food's up 30, 32 percent. Everything's up. It's not going to come down. They're not going to get it down. Even if they got it even right now, it doesn't matter. The damage is all done. No matter what you make, no matter how much your, your salary went up, it's peanuts compared to when you look at these all these uh, things. They were talking about housing prices. They were talking about uh, rental uh, if you rent an apartment anywhere in the country, you're up 40 percent, and uh, that you can't make up for that. Uh, he's been a disaster as a president, and uh, we're spending money hand over fist in Ukraine, as an example. And yet, uh, Europe, you add it up, it's a similar size economy as ours. Europe is not spending anything by comparison. We're in for $200 billion, or they're in for $22 billion. And yet, it certainly affects them more than it affects us. We have a thing called an ocean in between. They don't have that ocean. But they're not. And nobody's telling them to do it. I told them to spend for NATO. I said, you have to spend money. And they said, well, I don't really know. Would you protect us? I said, no, if you don't spend, we're not going to protect you. And all of a sudden, billions and bi hundreds of billions came pouring into NATO. Because I said that. You have to ask them for the money. They'll pay it if you ask them. I don't think anybody has asking them. But you, you look at, at the difference between what we're spending on Ukraine, as an example, and what they're spending. And the only difference is nobody's asking or they don't know how to ask. But you really probably have to tell them, this is what you're going to do, and they'll do it. So it's a very unfair thing. Very bad things are happening for our country. I don't think we've ever been in danger of World War III like we are right now. And I always say, and I say it in every speech, I will prevent World War III. I know all these people. I know. A good, bad, or indifferent, it doesn't make any difference. I know every one of them, and they're not going to mess around with us. We are weak. We are ineffective. We're left at as a country. And Bidenomics is a total disaster, to get back to your original uh, question. Well, you are so right. And, you know, we've got some good Iowans here with, with us tonight in the yeah. audience. So who here was better off financially with President Trump? <laughs> I think that's everybody, uh, President Trump. Yeah, I think that's the answer we have. I mean, it's absolutely overwhelming. Yeah. Americans, Iowans, were all better off with Trump. And, you know, a lot of that was due uh, to your leadership of our booming economy at that time, which was due uh, to your tax cuts, the yeah. tax cuts that you put in place. And so uh, as a follow-up to that, what would happen to our economy if Biden got his way and he allowed your Trump tax cuts to just expire. Well, you'd have the biggest tax increase in the history of our country. It will be devastating to people that will, on top of inflation and what's happened, and basically a bad economy. You know, it's a bad economy. It's not a real economy. Uh, you look at government jobs are up, but other jobs aren't up. But government jobs, well, government jobs, that's, you know, that's easy to do. Let's hire more people so we look good. That's like taking the uh, oil out of the strategic reserves. They take it out of... The big, we have the lowest 
uh, amount of oil in the strategic reserves right now than we've ever had. And that's not meant for automobiles for an election. That's meant for military. That's meant for trouble, big trouble in our country. It's meant to protect us. And, uh, you know, they practically drained it in the last election in order to keep uh, prices down. They're trying to do the same thing again. These, uh, they, they have done such damage to our country. And then we start talking about the border, okay, mm -hmm. the border. And we had the worst border in the history of the world. We had the safest border, the best border. I built over 500 miles of wall. People don't, you know, they say, is it a renovation or not a renovation? It's not a renovation. We had a wall that was falling down, demolished, uh, rusted steel, uh, rotted out two by fours, would rip it out. They'd say, oh, that was a renovation when we go up 30 feet high and nine feet deep. Uh, now, we built over 500 miles of wall. We were going to build another 200 miles, which is far more than I said I was going to do. And Mexico, by the way, speaking about Mexico, Mexico paid for 28,000 soldiers, and they were paying much more money than they would have paid for the war. There was no legal mechanism to do the war, but it didn't matter because they paid much more money. Uh, we had stay in Mexico, not stay. We had stay in Mexico. We kept people in Mexico. Nobody ever did that before, and Mexico behaved, but Mexico had to behave because I was going to tariff them if they didn't, and they were fine. They were actually very good. I like the president a lot. I mean, we get along very well. But Mexico paid a big price to give us the, the best border that we've ever had in the history of our country. That included drugs. That included terrorists coming in. I saw an interesting stat on a number of the shows. Uh, in 2019, they had no terrorists, zero, which I was frankly surprised to hear that. But that was during my term. We had very strong blockages and blocks. Uh, so we had nothing. And now we have record numbers of terrorists coming in, record numbers. We had none. I mean, they actually said zero. This is not me, because I would have said, it's got to be somebody, somebody. But they had nobody. And uh, we had a safe country. We had no attacks. We had no anything. I defeated ISIS. We wiped out ISIS. That was supposed to take four years. I did it in a few months. We have a great military when we have the right people. And we have the right people. I know the right people. They're not the television people, not the people that you're reading about, not the person that's now in a hospital uh, running this war from his laptop, which is what I understand he's doing, if he's running it at all. I'm not sure about that. But uh, that was a terrible thing. Five days, we didn't have any idea where our Secretary of Defense was. And we had people wanting to attack our country. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty sad situation. We've never been in a position of risk like we are right now, in many ways, but never like we are right now. Yeah. Well, wow, that is something we hear about everywhere in Iowa is, is how much Iowans appreciate how you secured the border and what you did to keep us safe. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. And you know, it's very interesting because if he just would have left it, he could have gone to the beach because he likes going to the beach. Somebody says he looks good in a bathing suit that works for him, obviously. Yeah. So you'd see him at the beach all the time. He could have done that, just left it alone, leave our people there, leave the great people that we had there. And instead, they decided to, we're not going to build the wall. And they put out a message to the world, come in. Because, you know, when you say that and you say other things, and you have people coming in and going to our schools and taking our, the places of our students, where they're actually putting our students, the students that were there, in secondary schools. And they're taking the best seats. And they don't even speak English. So they're sitting there. They don't speak English. The whole thing is crazy. You look at what's happened in New York. New York is a disaster right now. And in all fairness, the mayor understands that. And he's saying that. But you know, some don't speak up. Some aren't speaking up. Uh, the whole concept of sanctuary cities is going to, I think it's going to fall of its own weight. I think the Democrats aren't going to be able to take it much longer. Uh, in some cities, Democrat mayors and governors are saying, well, we just can't do this anymore. The truth is, it's not sustainable for this country, even from a cost standpoint. Billions and billions of dollars. People are coming in, and they're coming in from prisons. They're coming in from mental institutions, insane asylums. Uh, they're terrorists. They're, they're drug dealers. They're pouring into our country, totally unchecked. We have no idea who's coming in. They're coming in from many countries, all parts of the world. They're coming from Africa. They're coming from China. They're coming from all parts of Asia. Uh, a lot of people coming from Europe, a lot of people coming from Yemen, okay? We're, we're bombing right now. We have people from Yemen. We had 26, 27,000 people coming in over the last few months from China, and they happen to be from the age of about 19 to 25, just fighting age. That's great, you know? Not women, all men. 
Uh, and uh, it's a very, very sad thing happening to our country. Our country is being overtaken. We're being invaded. That's an invasion. We had the strongest border, and now we have the weakest border, and it's an invasion of our country. And Biden is grossly incompetent. The only thing they know how to do is cheat on elections. They're very good at cheating on elections, and they're very good at also going after your political opponent. But they can't do anything else. That's all they're good at. And we're going to teach them a lesson. Yeah. Okay? Well, President Trump, you are so right. Our, our borders in chaos with 10,000 unvetted illegals coming into our country every single day and the kids in New York being told to stay home because their schools are being used to, to house illegals. I mean, how do you secure the border and reverse Biden's disaster? Well, we'd go right back to what we were doing. Again, we had the safest border in the history of our country and we're going to close up the walls. You know, we had 200 miles of walls, we had a lot of wall built. It's laying there, ready to be lifted up. They could have had it completed in three weeks. And if you remember, because I remember it, it was all ready to go, and they said, we don't want it. And they actually moved the wall away. And in many cases, it's very expensive stuff. It's exactly what Border Patrol wanted. It's steel, concrete, and rebar. It had to have uh, spikes in it, it had to have... Uh, it's very complicated wall. It's a very expensive... They sold it for five cents on the dollar. They got rid of it, I think, like scrap metal. And it's not even believable. Uh, all they had to do is fill up the gaps. We're going to fill up the gaps, and we're going to end up actually building more. We're going to work with Mexico, but Mexico is not working with us right now. They want to be paid a lot of money. They said, we want $5 billion to start talking to the United States. They would never say that to me. They want five. The people are pouring through Mexico, and they want five to talk. And Every time Blinken goes over there or somebody goes over there, it costs us a lot of money. The money that we spend dealing with countries, we give them billions and billions of dollars, and then they don't listen to us. They don't do what we say. And I remember when China, China respected us three years ago a lot. They really respected us. And uh, the first meeting they had where they were lectured to by President Xi and China, they were, we were lectured like we were children. And that would never happen with me, and it never did. Yeah. Well, and uh, President Trump, as a follow-up, you've also been critical of Nikki Haley's record of opposing the border wall and also criticizing the travel ban. Uh, given the thousands of unvetted illegals that are coming across our southern border every day, why are Nikki Haley's comments dangerous and naive? Well, she's a globalist, and she works with Koch. Uh, it used to be Koch brothers. You know, David Koch, I knew very well. He was a nice guy. He was a member of my clubs and everything else. He was a, a big supporter in that way. But... Uh, they're globalists. I'm not. I'm a make America great again. I'm a America first people. It's just America first. It's so simple. I put America first. I always did, and I always will. And frankly, we spend trillions of dollars to other countries. Many of these countries don't respect us. They don't like us. They don't do what we tell them to do. And I stopped that whole process. But Nikki is a person that's getting a lot of her money from globalists, and globalists are not good for our country. They're not good for us. I know Nikki very well. She was my uh, uh, ambassador to the United Nations, and she had a lot of weakness, to be honest. She had a lot of weakness. In fact, I'm not a fan of Chris Christie. I thought he was, you know, third rate. He left with a 9% approval rating. New Jersey, a great state, which I hope to win. I hope we're going to win it. But he made some statements that uh, she's not going to make it. The, you know, the, the so-called hot mic. And I don't know if that was a hot mic on purpose or not. I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. But it was a, certainly a hot mic. Uh, I don't think Nikki's strong enough to be president. I know her very well. I know her better than anybody. I moved her there from the governor of South Carolina, and I moved Henry McMaster in. And one of the reasons I gave her that job is I wanted Henry McMaster to be governor. He was lieutenant governor. He's fantastic. You know him. And uh, he's done a great job. But that was one of the reasons I moved her. Uh, and she did okay. She was okay, but she's not strong enough to be president. I know her very well. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I think uh, we've got somebody here in the audience that really wants to ask you a question. Uh, Joe Mitchell's got a question for you. Hi, Joe. Yeah. Hey, Mr. President. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. Clearly, it's no secret that our country is in chaos. The world is in chaos. What happened with Yemen and the missile strikes the last few days, Ukraine, Palestine. We don't even know where the Secretary of Defense is right now. Are we on the brink of World War III? 
I think we're the closest that we've ever been. And, you know, Joe, this won't be a regular war. This is not going to be, as I say, army tanks running back and forth, shooting each other. These are weapons of mass destruction, the likes of which nobody's ever seen. I've seen. I've seen them. And uh, this is obliteration. This is not a world war like we are used to. World War I, World War II were terrible, horrible. Uh, this is uh, so much bigger than that. This is, you know, a, a, like annihilation. And we have people that can't put two sentences together. The, our president can't speak. He can't speak a full sentence. And he's negotiating with Putin, and he's negotiating with President Xi of China, who's very tough and very smart. You know, I say that, and the media says, oh, you called him smart. Yeah, he's smart. He's very smart. He controls 1.4 billion people with an iron fist. I'd say that's smart. And he's a guy who uh, loves China. And these are people that love their country, or certainly, uh, whether they love their country or not, they want to make their country great again, right? Like we're doing. We were doing things at this country that nobody's ever seen. Then COVID came in. We did a great job with that, but never got the respect for the job we did with COVID. Nobody knew what it was. All over the world, it was ripping countries apart. The damage China did, and I always said it came from Wuhan, and it did. It came from Wuhan, and uh, it, it was the damage done to this world $61 trillion, they figure. That's more than China has. That's more than everybody has put together. $61 trillion in damage. I don't know if you've ever heard that number, but that's, wow. and it's probably a relatively accurate number. They, you know, they really put the world back many, many years, what they've done. And uh, it's so sad to see that. But nobody's ever done the job. You know, we rebuilt the military. We gave the largest tax cuts in history. We gave the largest regulation cuts in history. Even from a health standpoint, right to try. We did right to try. That space age stuff. We have the best labs, the best doctors in the world. And we'd have things that won't come out for four or five or six years. They won't be approved. And I got it done. And they've been trying to get that done for 54 years. I got it done. And it saved thousands and thousands of lives. You know, nobody wanted it. The health companies didn't want it. The labs didn't want it. The doctors didn't want it. And the country didn't want it because everybody felt they were going to have liability. I got everybody in a room. The insurance companies didn't want it. I got them in a room. And I said, look, the patient's going to sign. No liability to anybody. And they were willing to do that. And we've saved thousands and thousands of lives. And you know, it's shown in this many cases that the drugs really work. You know, the drug companies didn't want it because they didn't want to take terminally ill people. The people that were terminal, and it was incredible because they'd say for years, we don't want to take a chance because if they get sick, I said, they're terminal. You know, it's like that these are really sick people. These are people that will be dead. They are dying. And they will have the right to use it. And they have had. And we've saved thousands and thousands of lives. And actually, it's been the opposite effect. Some of these drugs are so good that it actually proved that they were good, as opposed to you know the liability factor that the drugs co drug companies were worried about. So we're very proud of uh, everything we did. We're the greatest economy in the history of our country. And again, the biggest tax cuts in history. Uh, and that is f substantially bigger than Ronald Reagan's tax cuts. And he did it. now. The Democrats want to have that elapse. You know, it expires relatively soon. And that was a five-year deal. It expires. And if that's allowed to expire, your, tax, your taxes are going to go up at numbers that nobody, the biggest tax increase in history. And it'll also be very bad for the economy of, you know, for the, for the country. You know, it's interesting. When I cut the taxes to that tremendous extent, including for businesses, Everybody said, oh, wow, it's not going to be income. We're taking much more income now than we did before with the higher tax rates. If they allow that to expire, which they'd like to do, I believe, I, th I think they have a tremendous liability, because even politically, why would you vote for somebody that's going to raise your taxes by 75%? And that's what you're going to be doing. If you vote for crooked Joe Biden, and he's crooked as you can be, there's never been a president more crooked than this guy. If you vote for him, and remember this, he got a lot of money from China. He got a lot of money from Ukraine. He got a lot of money from Russia. Do you remember during the debate when I said, how come you got three and a half million dollars from the mayor of Moscow's wife? And Chris Wallace wouldn't let me ask that question. He said, well, I have to stop you. What is that? Well, that's become a very big subject. Why did he get it? And he can't answer why he got it. But we have sort of a Manchurian candidate in there. 
He's a, uh, he's a guy who's very compromised, in my opinion. And that's why China is getting away with murder. You know, China now is not doing well because of my tariffs. They cannot take the tariffs off because it's so much money coming into our country that they can't really justify taking the tariffs off. And they were, I took in hundreds of billions of dollars from China. Hundreds of billions. No other president ever took in 10 cents. And I got along great with President Xi until COVID. That was a step too far. I couldn't do it. But I have, you know, I had a great relationship with him. But he was not thrilled with the tariffs. But we took in hundreds of billions of dollars. Think of it. And no other president ever took in not 10 cents. And we were really rocking and rolling. And then this guy comes into office, and it's so bad. And we're a laughing stock as a country. As you know, we're a laughing stock all over the world. Very sad. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Well, Ukraine's also been a big hot button issue on the campaign trail. And Biden, DeSantis, Haley, they all want to send more weapons and more money to keep the war going. Uh, what do you think should be done with regard to Ukraine? Well, I think, again, Europe has to start paying because uh, I feel very badly for the people. It's so terrible. But remember this. Russia's a war machine. They defeated Hitler. They defeated Napoleon. That's what they do. A friend of mine, a great guy, uh, a lot of people maybe think he's a little tough, but that's okay. Uh, Viktor Orban, prime minister of Hungary, uh, he knows those countries very well. He's right there. He knows them very, very well, intimately. And he will tell you, you know, Russia is this monster uh, machine. We knock out 60 tanks, and everybody's bragging about the 60 tanks, but they've got 12,000 more tanks right behind them, 12,000. Wow. And they actually have a lot more than that. So it's a very tough thing, and you look at what the damage that's been done. Here's the most important thing. It would have never happened, and it didn't happen, and it was unthinkable. I used to talk to Putin about it. It was the apple of his eyes, and I said, don't ever do it, don't ever do it. And we had great talks about it. He would have never done it. And he wouldn't have done it for two reasons. Number one, because I said, don't do it. But you know what else? I had it down at $40 a barrel. As soon as I got out, Biden did horrible moves, and it went to $100 a barrel. At $100 a barrel, he was making so much money, he had the money to prosecute the war. So that was another reason. He wouldn't have done it anyway. But, you know, the other one, and we'll bring it right up to date, is uh, Israel would have never been attacked. Uh, if you know, and I think you know, I think most people know, that Iran was broke during my administration. They were dead, flat, broke. And I said to China and I said to other countries, if you buy oil from Iran, you cannot do anything having to do with the U.S. You cannot do any business with us. You're out of business. And they all make money with us. They do a lot of trade. And, you know, most of their trade deals are negotiated by other people. And they weren't the greatest. But that's the only thing good about making bad trade deals is you have other countries. They'll do whatever you want because they don't want to lose it. But what happens is I said, don't do it. And China didn't buy. China bought nothing, practically. And they all backed down. And now he took all those sanctions off. He took all of that threat off. And uh, I would say they have in excess of $200 billion Iran, all made in the last few years, not to mention the $6 billion that they got on the hostage. You know, we had five hostages. They, got, they gave them $6 billion for five hostages. Those are, must be pretty important hostages. Two of them were hikers. Two of them were, you know, hey, if you decide to go hiking in Iran, you have a liability. You just don't do that. <laughs> Okay, we don't have to give a, a billion for the two of you, uh, but we gave, and we also gave 10 billion for selling electricity to Iraq, and yet they control Iraq. Iraq is like a subsidiary, and remember, Iraq is now controlled by Iran. That was the stupidest war, I have to tell you. That was the stupidest, most, I used to say, and I think you remember this when I was a civilian in the true sense, but I got always, somehow I got a lot of press, but I'd say, don't ever go into Iraq, but if you do go in, keep the oil. Remember that? Keep the oil. If you go in, but don't do it, but if you do, keep the oil. They didn't keep the oil. We're the only country where we go in, we obliterate somebody. We never, we never keep anything. We just get stuck in these endless wars. And I got us out of Syria. I got us out of Iraq. I got us out of everywhere, and we defeated ISIS. ISIS was a big thing. We knocked out al-Baghdadi, al-Baghdadi, the leader and founder of ISIS. He was trying to rebuild it again. Uh, we uh, remember Conan the dog. Conan did a good job. 
Conan almost got electrocuted, but Conan did a great job. <laughs> he heard Conan coming, and that was the end of him. But uh, we went in, and they were after him for 20 years. I got him. I got him. And uh, we did a hell of a job. Did a hell of a job. And these people are not doing a good job. Now, I know the two people we're talking about, because before we get to Biden, we have to knock, knock off two people, and sort of three people. I don't think there's a lot of threat beyond the two, but I don't think the two have much threat right now either. Uh, if you're leading Nikki in South Carolina by 60 points, that's not bad. You know, she was the governor of South Carolina. You shouldn't be leading by 60 points. I don't like her. Uh, but we should be able to, I think we have a, a huge, uh, a huge advantage here because the only thing is I just landed in an airplane and it's nasty out there. You know, <laughs> from the airplane to the car was about 20 feet and I'm saying, wow, that's, you're blowing it. You have a hard time reaching, you have a hard time reaching it. But it's, it's getting better. Uh, I worry about that. But at the same time, I'm watching even the newscast today. They're saying the Trump voter has so much more spirit, dedication. They say they'll walk over at last that the Trump voters coming to vote. Yes. Their voters aren't necessarily. Yes. That's a big thing. they got to come to vote. Well, I, I think you can tell the Trump voter is coming to vote. I mean, look at all the enthusiasm here in this room, and it's all over yeah. the whole state. And, you know, we're used to it being cold, dark, you know, snowy in January. Yeah. But we're also, uh, we remember what it was like when you were president. And people are on fire. They are going to make it happen on caucus night. They're not going to stay in their warm house. They're going to go, and, and they're going to caucus for you, President Trump. We just need to make sure everybody gets out and does that for you. I hope that's right. And I think it is right. They, they just had a poll. They just had a poll that just came out as I was leaving. I don't know, poll, there's so many polling companies, but they're all very good. We had one fake poll that came out of CNN, and, you know, Fox puts it on, everybody puts it on. They're so happy. But even that, I was leading by, like, nine points. You know, it's pretty good when you're leading by nine points. This is in New Hampshire. In Iowa, I'm leading by 30 and 35 and 40 points in every poll. They can't find a bad one, so they, you know, try and report it as little as possible. But here we're leading big. Uh, in New Hampshire, I think we're leading really big outside of one fake poll, you know, fake news CNN. And that's why nobody watches it anymore, right? That's right. But, uh, but we're doing great in, in New Hampshire also, I think. Really good. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit, too, about uh, Social Security and Medicare, because that's something uh, that's important to a lot of people. And uh, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley have both called for raising the retirement age and yeah. making major cuts to Social Security and Medicare benefits. And when you were president, you protected Social Security and Medicare for American seniors, and you promised to do so again yep. in your second term. Tell us why that's so important to you. First of all, they, you've earned it. I mean, they've earned it. They want to cut it, and they also want to, you know, the Medicare, they want to cut that. And, and why are you doing this? We have more liquid gold right under our feet. We have so much wealth in this country, and we don't want to do it. We want to go to all electric cars so that we don't use our wealth. You know, China has that kind of wealth because they have the battery wealth. But electric cars don't go far. They're very expensive, and they're going to all be made in China. That's why I think we had a poll just come out, and we're 11 points up in Michigan because the auto workers and, you know, South Carolina way up to, uh, wherever you make autos, because the auto workers understand if you go all electric, you're making those cars in China. They're not going to be made here. They're going to be made in China. And uh, in addition to that, you should be able to buy electric cars, but you have to buy gasoline, combustion. You have to buy uh, anything you want. You shouldn't be restricting it to electric. You go to California. I was there this summer, and you have blackouts and brownouts all the time, and now we're supposed to, they want all their cars to be all electric. The problem is, though, with, with the car, uh, the batteries are very, somewhat expensive, uh, but they're really, uh, they can be very dangerous, you know that, and they can be very big. They take up a lot of room, like they want to go all electric trucks. And half of the capacity that the truck is supposed to use for load is going to be a battery. But the other problem is they just don't go far. They just don't go far. A truck will go 300 miles, a big, you know, an 18-wheeler, go 300 miles, and on gasoline, you take a Peterbilt or, you know, one of the, the great uh, companies that really build, do great jobs, uh, they'll go 2,000 miles. So you go 2,000 miles on diesel, 
And the tank for the diesel is very small compared to the battery. The battery to go even three or 400 miles is much, much bigger than the tank. So they're going to have to devote a lot of that. And, and some of the things that I stopped, they want to go all electric army tanks, OK? The problem is they don't go far. And it's a different kind of power also, by the way. But they don't go far. You know, you say, what are they doing? And I somewhat joke. I'm trying to be sarcastic about it. I say, they go into obliterate a country, an enemy, because they want to make the atmosphere nice and safe, nice and clean. We want a pure, clean atmosphere as we knock the country to hell. The whole thing is crazy, and the battery is so big that to do it properly, they'd have to pull a truck behind it to carry the battery. Can you believe it? Unbelievable. So they want to do that. They want to do the boat. Now they want to do boats. They want boats to be all electric. The whole thing is so crazy. I call it the Green New Scam. Yeah. Not the right. Green New Deal. It's a right. Green New Scam. Right. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, and President Trump, you're way up in the polls. You know, you're winning big. Uh, but Biden has weaponized our justice system yep. against his leading opponent, and that's you. Yep. Yes, uh, and he's, he's trying to dampen our enthusiasm of our movement, and he's committing election interference. Uh, and you and know, election fraud. Yes. Yeah, he's, a, yeah. he's a fraud. Uh, he, no, it's never happened before in the history. It's happened in third world countries. It happens like in banana republics. Never happened in this country, at least nothing like this. And uh, they go around, and you see what's going on. Look at, look at it as an example, because it's all coordinated. Look at Georgia, what happened there. And now that's turned into a massive scandal where the prosecutor was getting all sorts of money. I think that uh, deranged Jack Smith is a totally compromised prosecutor. I mean, he's got a bad, he's got some bad stuff, really bad stuff and dangerous stuff for the country. But these are, these are bad people. They're really bad people, and they've never done this before. When a candidate is willing to weaponize against his political opponent, you no longer really have a democracy. And I think I'm doing very well with it. You know, it's very interesting. Um, I don't think it's ever happened before to another candidate where something like this would happen on, obviously, a much smaller scale. But they announced on one of the networks today that I'm leading by more than any candidate has ever led in history. Now, we still have to, you know, go, go out and vote because we have to do it with facts. Polls don't mean anything, but in the polls, we have the best numbers ever. I don't believe I'd have numbers as high. I think I'd be leading by a lot, because we did a great job. You know, they're going on what we did all together, but I don't think I'd be leading by anywhere near as much. When you see a national poll came out today, 71. I have, I'm at 71. Ron DeSanctimonious is at, like, 9, and I think Nikki's at 9 or 10. And she may, have, she may be replacing him. He spent... You know, he's gone through about $250 million, and he's only gone down, so there's something wrong. But if they didn't weaponize, I probably wouldn't be doing as well. So that tells you the people understand it. I got all these judges, they hate me. Like in New York, they hate me. It's so, you know, it's radical left, crazy judges. They're crazy. And you, you take a look at what's happening. You have trials, and they give you a verdict before you, the trial starts. They gave me a verdict in New York before the trial starts. I had another one. I have, a, I have to go and I said, could we have a day off? My wife's incredible mother, this was an incredible woman. My wife loves her so much. A first lady, her mother died. And one of the most incredible people. And the judge says, essentially, you can't go to the funeral because we're not going to give you the time. So if I go to the funeral, I can't be at the trial. They're not going to hold up the trial. Now, think of it. This is a radical left judge, Kaplan. This is a radical left judge appointed by Clinton. And that's the way it is. The Democrats play that way. The Republicans don't. Uh, Republican judges, in all fairness, they want to be, they, they go overboard. If I appoint somebody, they go overboard to give the other side the benefit of the doubt. Okay? Absolutely overboard. Whereas the Democrats, if you get appointed by Obama or Biden, they, they're down and dirty. They, they say, I don't care. It's a whole different thing. And people can say that's not true, but it's totally true. Uh, Republicans, they want to go out of their way to show that they're not influenced or they're not biased or that they're fair and they're really hurting our country. Uh, the Democrats are, you just see it in New York, you see these judges. He gives me a verdict that I'm guilty and my lawyers go up, we don't even know how has it happened. The trial didn't start, he knows nothing about me. They don't have the facts, they have the figure. Then they say about Mar-a-Lago, the judge ruled it was worth $18 million, but it's actually worth over a billion dollars. He said $18 million. 
And everyone says, how do you get that? Now, I'm not, it's an incredible property. It's just a question of what's it worth? People come in, it's worth a lot of money. He said it was worth $18 million. That's a lot of money too, but in Palm Beach, it's not. In Palm Beach, it's less than a starter house. It's crazy, right? Palm Beach, but they, they make corrupt rulings in order to try and prove their case. And they do it, and they do it against us. And the system, the legal system, is a mess in our country. It's a mess. It absolutely, it's a disgrace what's going on with judges. And again, Democrat judges, especially the radical left Democrats, uh, say what you want. I, I was scolded once by a certain Supreme Court justice, who I like and respect. He said, no, no. You have Trump judges. You have Obama judges. You have judges. They're all judges. They're all essentially the same. I said, I disagree with that. It's just the way it is. I disagree. Republican judges, they go out of their way. And, you know, we have some very big uh, decisions coming up, like immunity, as an example. Mm -hmm. A president of the United States has to have immunity. Because if you don't have immunity, every president that leaves office will be indicted by the sitting president of an opposing party. When I say every, most of them, okay, most of them, they'll say, oh, like in the case of Obama, he sends missiles in, he kills a lot of civilians. Or the case of Biden, the wall, the not building it, to, for him not to have finished those open areas, for him to allow people to come into our country, for him to allow crime like we've allowed, for him to do the things that he's done, he's been such a horrible president. So that would mean you have to have immunity, otherwise the president is not going to be able to function. They're going to say, well, wait a minute, I don't want to get indicted as soon as I leave. And you'll, you'll make some decisions that aren't going to be great decisions. But if you don't have immunity, you're not going to be able to function as a president. Yeah, well, I think Iowans and Americans, they see right through that. You know, they, they have seen that you have had a target on your back uh, since day one. You really have. You really have. And I, I think... I think the polls, you talked about some of them, that the polls really show that too. So uh, Rasmussen shows you beating Biden nationally by eight points. Yeah. That's huge. Uh, there was a poll that just came out from the Detroit U uh, News, and it has you beating Biden in Michigan yeah. by eight points. That is awesome. Uh, and then future majority has you beating Biden in Pennsylvania by six points. Yeah. And that's just a few. I mean, how can you drain the swamp and how can you root out those deep state activists who are working with the media to destroy our democracy? So, and I love that question. It's such an important drain the swamp. You know, I said that I never loved the term, but it really caught on somehow. It we fits. have to drain. And we did. When I fired Comey, that was a wonderful day. And we fired a lot of different people. Uh, I didn't say I made it easier myself. But, we had a but, but you talk about the polls. So Nikki Haley early on had a good poll. It was a fake poll. But she had a good poll where she was up on Biden. But she hasn't had that since. She's getting killed by Biden. She's losing everywhere to Biden. And they used the one poll that was very early that was absolutely ridiculous. And I'm beating him in every poll. Every, every single poll now, I'm beating him by a lot. And she's going to lose. She's not going to be able to beat Biden. And, and it's not Biden. People say, how could the guy, he can't, he can't walk off a stage. He can't find the stairs. If a stair is right there when you finish with your speech, he's looking all over. He's trying to find the stair. And they have to send people up to take him. But the whole thing is crazy. I personally... I don't really think he's going to run, but let's see what happens. I think they're going to stop him. I don't believe they're going to let him. But if he does, that's fine. And if he, whoever it may be, we just have to win because their ideology is so bad. But how do you do that where a guy, a friend of mine said, you know, you're up 11 on Biden. How come, and he's not a, you know, political person, but a very smart person, big, big businessman, called me up. He said, how can you only be winning by 11? Well, 11's a lot in the world of politics. But you have to understand, they have the unions, but I think we've broken into the unions now. I think we're going to have the unions other than the top people. We may even have some of the top people, as you probably just saw. But they have the unions, and they have civil service, but we treat civil service, too. They have tremendous welfare votes, and they have the welfare vote, and they have a base of about 38, 39 percent. It was interesting because let's say they have 39 percent. We have to do it the old fashioned way. We have to run the East Coast. We have to run all sorts of places like Iowa. We have to run everything and we have to win like we did in 2016. And we did much better 
in 2020, getting millions. I mean, we got millions more votes than we did in 2016. We did actually much better. You know, people say, oh, well, I don't know. How's that? But most people understand what happened. OK, most people understand what happened. We did so much better in 2020. Look, 2016 was unique and it was a big surprise to a lot of people, except for the people that went to rallies and all. You know, it's interesting. We'd have a rally 2020 also. We'd have a rally and we'd have 35, 40,000 people show up on one day notice. Right. Yeah. And he announced for two weeks that he's coming and they couldn't fill the eight circles. You know, those beautiful circles. <laughs> they were nice. They were actually very nice. They did a good job. I'd like to find the person. They were very, I'm into the world of construction and things. They did a beautiful job. They had to use the fake news media to fill them up. So they have people from CNN standing in a circle. And then they'd say, oh, Trump didn't win Arizona. I mean, I left Arizona. We had 48,000 people. He left Arizona. He literally couldn't fill up the circles. And then we hear we lost by a whisker. We lost just by this much. Uh, We've got to clean up our elections. Yeah. We've got to clean them up because we don't, we don't have to clean up our borders. Our borders and our elections yeah. have to do it. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. President, caucus night is coming right up. Yep. It, is, it is Monday night, uh, and we need everybody to find yep. out where their caucus is, come to their caucus, come early at 6.30, Bring your ID. Yep. The caucus starts at 7, yep. and you cannot be late. There's no late voting in a caucus. You have to be there on time. What is your message to your strong Trump supporters who see the dirty tricks from Biden that are designed to suppress the Trump vote? And what is your message to your supporters who see you ahead in polling and they wonder if their vote matters? Well, that's a big thing. So we're leading by a lot in all the polls, and you have to get out because we have to send a message, most importantly for November, because we have to beat this guy. And, you know, if you say, gee, we're leading by a lot, but let's not get in, especially with weather like this, you just have to get out. And a friend of mine said, they're hardy people in Iowa, and they are hard. I know plenty of them, and you're one of them. Right? So... You're one of the great attorney generals in the country. And I have to say, uh, before we get off, you it was such an honor to get your very early endorsement and uh, really something that was very special. And it meant a lot to me, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I was glad to do it because we need you back as president. Iowa wants you back. The whole country wants you back in the White House. Thank we you. need you. Thank, Thank you. you. We, did, uh, we will not let you down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think we heard it straight from you. It's absolutely important that people show up to their yep. caucus site. 6.30, Monday night. That's right. Uh, you have a big lead, but you need them to be there for you to send that big message to Biden and to the whole country that it's sometimes the road to the White House starts in Iowa. This time it ends in Iowa, right? <laughs> yep. And, you know, it's very important to me because Iowa, I think of two things. I think of farmers but you have a lot of other business. But I think of farmers and I think of politics. And you're first in the nation because of me, not because of the governor, not because of anyone else, you're because of me. Because I put you there. It was up to me and I put you there. And there was tremendous, uh, really, blowback on doing it. They wanted to put you further back. You're not that big. And some people say you don't represent the country. I think you represent the country as well as anybody or better than anybody. Uh, to me, Iowa is such a great uh, institution, having it first in the nation. And I kept you there. As you know, the Democrats moved. They left. They fled town. And I'm sure they're going to remember that. But it looks like we're going to beat them pretty easily in this state anyway. But it was an honor for me to keep you first in the nation. I fulfilled my promises. I fulfilled my promises on ethanol. I got the farmers $28 billion. You know, I said... Uh, I guess a couple of people came to say, please don't be so arrogant about getting the Iowa vote. I said, look, I got them 28 billion from China. Do you think Biden would get you 28 billion? He'll lose you 28 billion. And the farmers did, that was one of the greatest deals I made, but I don't talk about it. It was with China because of COVID. I don't even talk about it, but 28 billion, took care of your ethanol, took care of every problem you had. There's nobody, it's been said in even editorials, there's nobody that's done more for Iowa than Donald Trump when I was president, and it was really, uh, really an honor to do so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Trump. And uh, now we're going to stay tuned for a special message from Team Trump that explains the caucus process. Oh, that's yeah. exciting. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> Making America great again starts one place on earth and one place only, right here in Iowa. Monday, January 15th, 7 p.m. Be there, because it's caucus night. Now you may say to yourself, self, I've never been to a caucus, how does it work? You've come to the right place. Because for the next two minutes, Marlin's going to tell you everything you need to know about how to successfully caucus for President Trump. Caucusing is super easy. Before we get going, let's make sure you are eligible to caucus. Time to check with the lawyers. For that, here's Margo from the law firm of Dewey, Dewey & Chittister. To vote at a caucus, you must be at least 18 years old. But here's the kicker. That's 18 by November 5th of 2024, election day. Okay, so now you know you're eligible to vote in the Iowa caucus. Woohoo! How simple is it to caucus? As simple as this. Wait, that's, that's the wrong one. As simple as this. Three easy steps. Step one, make sure you're eligible. Done. Okay, step two, do you know where your caucus location is? Now be careful, the correct answer isn't necessarily your regular voting location. I'm throwing you a lifeline here. You can easily find your caucus location and lots of other information by going to donaldjtrump.com slash Iowa caucus. Now, a quick time management lesson. It's Monday, January 15th, caucus day. You wake up at 5 a.m. because you are so excited to caucus for President Trump. So what time should you get to your caucus location? Aren't you the go-getter? You don't need to be to your caucus location until 6 p.m. So no excuses for being late. And finally, step three, register once you get to your caucus. Now, if the line is long, don't panic. I said, don't panic. Sorry. The lines move very quickly. And once you're in line, you can't be turned away. So hang in there. Okay, starting exactly at 7 p.m., it's time for democracy to begin. First, you will hear a few brief speeches. Then paper ballots for voting will be distributed, collected, and counted, all in front of you. Easy peasy. And that's the first step to making President Trump our next president and making America great again.